What is this garbage you're watching? Hey, I want to watch the, the news. news. Are you making are you making headway at least? This is the news. In early September 2018, I completed what I consider to be my most important life's work to that point. It was a culmination of years of studying what may be the greatest immediate challenge facing humankind today. It was presented in the, in the form of a video called 21st Century Mind Control Programs Remote Neuromonitoring. In that video, I provided conclusive evidence of the existence of the latest versions of mind control programs, described the entire programs in considerable detail, and demonstrated how it has affected me and others. That video is long, over four hours, but every minute was necessary, in my view, because of the sheer scope of these illegal activities. Now I will begin to break down that video into subject groups, each with its own separate video. But first, a bit of a background summary about me. I am an United States Air Force veteran of 25 plus years of service with a career that culminated with a promotion to the second highest enlisted grade of E8, which is Senior Master Sergeant in the Air Force. My military career field was petroleum logistics, where I worked in all facets of the profession, from aircraft refueling to quality control, operations management, specializations in contingency, wartime planning, and finally senior division enlisted manager in charge of nearly 60 personnel with signatory custodial control of assets valued at $30 million. I've earned a Bachelor's of Science degree in Business Management as well as an Associate's of Science degree in Logistics. I have formalized training in Logistics Management, Quality Control, Quality Assurance, and Construction Quality Management. I listed all of those because collectively that type of training demonstrates that I have been formally trained to pay attention to detail. After retiring from active duty in 2004, I've held position as construction superintendent, construction manager, construction project manager. In each case, the formalized field was a relatively specialized sector, repair, restoration, and upgrades to aviation and ground fuels storage and distribution systems, working primarily with aircraft fuel storage systems, I manage sometimes having signatory responsibility called responsible officer for multi-million dollar government construction contracts. I also earned a license as a real estate sales professional in the state of Florida, where I worked as a realtor for a couple of years. Okay, that's enough about my background. I begin this first in the series of videos with the five phases of psychological terror and remote neuromonitoring, RNM for short, because this is the most important concept that every victim must learn if they are to have any chance of surviving this horrific program that terrorizes hundreds, perhaps thousands of Americans every day of our lives. If you are a non-victim, you may be thinking, why should I care about this? Or you may question if it's even real. I cannot convince you of anything. I can only provide information. I challenge you to examine my words. Even 
to debunk my information. As to the first question, why should you care? This is how I answer that question in the original video. What does unlimited access to the human mind mean that you have not yet considered? The billions of dollars spent on these programs are not an exercise to see how much money they can spend. There's a purpose. What are the implications of access to every thought, every word that enters any mind on earth? It is the ability to know your computer password. It is the ability to know your bank account number and the balance. It is the ability to know your home security system password, making it impossible to detect intrusions when you're away. It is the ability to know your plans for a business startup, your invention, and all the steps you have planned to bring them to market. It is the ability to know your plans to buy or sell stock and the rationale for each action. It is the ability to know your favorite position in bed and who you would prefer to have to share it. It is the ability to know what you will testify in court and more importantly, what you do not want to say. It is the ability to know what you really think about your mother-in-law, your co-worker, your boss, or your neighbor. It is the ability to know what you did last month, last year, or what you plan to do in the next 30 minutes, next month, or next year. It is every thought that you ever have about anything, every word that you ever say, every sight that you ever see for the rest of your life. The human mind has no firewall. So you see the threat to every person on this planet is real. In my video, 21st Century Mind Control Programs, Remote Neural Monitoring, I also describe how each person is conditioned and indoctrinated into the program. Describe the horrors of each of the so-called non-lethal weapons, such as directed energy, and showed you how each victim is targeted, sometimes in areas with other people around without affecting the people near us. I provided evidence of what they do to us while we sleep, how they control our heart rate and manipulate our dreams. I showed you the connection between gang stalking, directed energy weapons, voice to skull, and other harassment techniques, and the subsequent far too common false diagnosis of mental illness. The video includes hard evidence of our government's research into mass mind control, including actual contract documents. My presentation also presents a logical argument for why these programs exist. In other words, what they all aim to accomplish. I take you through the advanced electronic controls such as online programs, manipulations, integrated software features that make windows accessible to their every desire to monitor everyone in real time. I take you through U.S. historical evidence of involuntary human testings and the horrors that have been admitted in declassified documents. Then I present absolute evidence of what they have done to me, from force whistleblower to a myriad of elaborate traps and games. In each case, I offer hard evidence in the form of documents, real-time video recordings, as well as methodically documented personal observations. Over the coming days and weeks, I will release several more parts, each concentrating on a particular area of this insidious r and program that has been labeled targeted individuals, likely by the same organizations behind the attacks. Targeted individuals, in my opinion, is just a diversionary propaganda term that shifts the focus away from the fact that we are actually unwitting victims of the remote neural monitoring programs, which is basically body hacking, human non-lethal weapons testing, and data collection that is subsequently input into behavior modification programs with the final goal of perfecting means and methods of gaining control 
and predictability over all human behavior. That behavior control starts with learning how to control the unwitting and involuntary victims that I call VITIs, meaning victims of involuntary technology interface, which in my opinion describes exactly what we victims face every day. How does one control hundreds, even thousands of victims during the data collections involved in these illegal activities? And how do they avoid being held accountable for their crimes? In this video, I will explain why they conduct the so-called no-touch torture tactics and how they get away with it. Let's pick it up there. The earliest mind control programs that most of us are familiar with are from the previously top secret MK Ultra and Project Monarch files. Subsequent declassified documents allege that MK Ultra programs were terminated in 1966 or 67. Imagine this. What if that program, arguably the most horrific, non-consensual human experimentation program in history never actually ended. What if the previous version of the program paled in comparison to its current successor? What would the United States do or say to hide its active mind control program for which it is fully aware are illegal and would be considered reprehensible by any civilized human being on the planet. It would be easy and perhaps expected for someone who has no knowledge of what we endure every day to just say that we're crazy. In fact, those are the perpetrator's goals and expectations. Using dissident opposition tactics that appear to be straight out of Cold War Soviet Union the United States has now taken a commanding position on the globe at controlling all forms of opposition by forcing victims into situations that hold a high degree of similarity to symptoms of mental illness, while deploying tactics that are designed to lead people around us to believe that we are displaying systematic signs of mental illness. However, in the presence of fact, we are simply unwitting participants of programs designed to mimic a wide range of classic mental health conditions through constant and continuous stress, remotely induced pain, and relentless overt surveillance that gives the victim the feeling that there is no peace or refuge from this nightmare. It is very important to understand that Every tactic used against mind control victims is designed to make it look like the victim is suffering from mental illness. False diagnosis of mental illness is the ultimate get out of jail card defense because it removes the perpetrator's need to answer any question and absolute essential protection for them because under the thinnest level of scrutiny, the evidence of unlawful and inhumane crimes are blatantly obvious. Each tactic forms a basis for one or another form of mental illness, harassments that are untraceable and far too often outside the technical expertise of the victim to record and communicate in a way that proves that crimes were committed. I think I have that expertise. You've undoubtedly been told you're mentally ill for daring to say that the emperor called psychiatry has no clothes, not to mention stupid and unscientific. At least this is what some of my colleagues say about me at one university. So if this is something that has happened to you, I'm here to say that you are not alone the controversy regarding the myth of mental illness and psychiatry is not about science or medicine, it's about power. 
When psychiatrists start agreeing with you, well, then perhaps you ought to reconsider your position. <laughs> Something may be wrong. So I'd like to say a few disobedient things, which is especially true because I was trained as a psychologist, and when a member of the profession criticizes its own, it's considered especially sacrilegious. What do we know that is true that the cult of psychiatry keeps telling us is false? First, the idea that there is a known brain lesion causing mental illness. The truth is we cannot tell who is mentally ill and who is not by looking at pictures of their brains or analyzing their blood. Psychiatrists had to invent their own book of diseases because pathologists would have nothing to do with them. It's called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, the DSM, a great work of fiction. <laughs> What's the difference? Thank you. What's the difference between the DSM and a scientific book of disease? Every disorder in the DSM is invented. Every disease listed in a pathology textbook is discovered. Real disease is found in a cadaver at autopsy. Mental illness is not. Mental illness refers to something that a person does. Real disease refers to something that a person has. Consider this yet another way. It takes one person to have a real disease. It takes two people to have a mental illness. <laughs> if you're alone on an island, you could develop a real disease like cancer or heart disease, but you cannot develop a mental illness such as hyperactivity or schizophrenia. This is because mental illness is always diagnosed on the basis of some sort of social conflict. When people do something that others find objectionable, they can be diagnosed as mentally ill. If the person doing the diagnosing is more powerful than the person diagnosed, then there is trouble. In this sense, the diagnosis of mental illness is always a weapon you have to have someone else present to judge that your behavior is morally good or bad in order to have a mental illness. So diagnosis is a weapon, a tool people use against one another, especially when there is some kind of power conflict present. And what of treatment? Treatment for mental illness is punishment. Look at our criminal justice system. When someone commits a crime and a psychiatrist is in the courtroom, a defendant may go to a mental institution instead of a prison. Can you imagine a judge saying, I sentence you to treatment for your cancer. <laughs> I submit to you that psychiatric treatment is worse than prison. For in prison, they don't judge how long people should be deprived of liberty on the basis of what they think about themselves and the world. In a mental institution, of course, this is the case. If you don't think about yourself and the world correctly, you'll be punished longer. Psychiatrists love to say that mental illness is a real disease, just like cancer. The analogy between mental illness and real disease is not reciprocal. It doesn't hold both ways. Having cancer is not like being depressed. We don't shock people who have cancer to make them better, especially if they don't want to be shocked. Consider how melanoma, a deadly form of skin cancer, is a disease here as well as in northern India. If you have melanoma, does it cease to exist if you move to another country, another culture? Of course not. If you're wandering the foothills of the Himalayas and meditating for 15 hours a day, you may very well be called a holy man in India. Take that same person, have him walk across the grounds of the Washington Monument in Washington, D.C., and he's diagnosed a paranoid schizophrenic 
and committed to a mental hospital. What do you think psychiatrists would do if Jesus were alive today, or Buddha, or Mohammed? Bada-bing! Right into a mental hospital, injected with drugs to stop their crazy beliefs and speech. Psychiatrists today are the true grand inquisitors. They would crucify the holy men and women of yesterday in an instant. My father was sent from Nazi Germany to America in 1933 when he was about 15 years old. From the time he was sent out of Germany by his family because he was a Jew until his dying day, five years ago, he had nightmares that the Nazis were persecuting him. He fought against them his whole life, awake and asleep. I used to ask him, Dad, what were people thinking in Germany back then? What were they thinking when they saw the Nazis parading about? And he used to say, nobody took them seriously. Nobody believed they could ever have the power to do what they did. We laughed at them. Now, while I encourage you to laugh in the face of those psychiatrists who argue that two plus two doesn't equal four, know, too, that we must also take them seriously, especially when it comes to the harm they have done to people in the name of helping them. For if we do not, history will repeat itself. We are building a resistance to the psychiatric Gestapo. The Citizens Commission on Human Rights is an important partner in the fight for liberty and justice. That is why we are here tonight, and that is why we will be together tomorrow. Thank you. A new independent review has revealed extensive details on how members of the American Psychological Association, the world's largest association of psychologists, were complicit in torture and lied and cover up their close collaboration with officials at the Pentagon and CIA to weaken the association's ethical guidelines and allow psychologists to participate in the government's so-called enhanced interrogation programs after 9-11. The 542-page report was commissioned by the association's board of directors last year, based on an independent review by a former assistant U.S. attorney, David Hoffman. It undermines the APA's repeated denials that some of its more than 130,000 members were complicit in torture. The report's findings were first revealed Friday in The New York Times and conclude the association's, quote, principal motive in doing so was to align APA and curry favor with DOD. That's the Department of Defense. Well, as you know, Amy, and those who've watched the show for years, since um, at least 2005, there's been a major debate in the association and the profession about the role of psychologists and national security interrogations and torture. The association has denied it, as you said. The, so the report says that the association was wrong. The, the so-called dissidents, the critics, were right. So the main findings are that there was a years-long conspiracy to collude between the Amer leadership of the association and representatives of the Bush administration intelligence agencies, the Defense Department and CIA. Second, that there was a major duplicitous PR campaign to falsely present the uh, APA as being concerned about human rights and detainee welfare when, as Mr. Hoffman shows in the report, they were, their actions were not motivated by that at all. Uh, thirdly, they, um, while claiming that they would investigate all claims of abuse, in fact, they dismissed without any reasonable investigation claims of abuse that were filed with their ethics office. So how do they control so many people? That is the question that I posed in the original video and where we will pick up that video in this presentation. With potentially thousands of test victims at any given time in their system, how is it possible to control all of them? They do this through intense psychological warfare, nonstop harassment, isolation, and other elaborate 
systems that deny the victim's ability to make a formal complaint. Let's look at the entire psychological warfare program along with each of the processes and stages. The following are the typical stages of this insidious program. The typical pattern of attacks from the victim's inception into the mind control program to the end of the program, which far too often finalizes for the individual with the victim's death. The following conclusions are based on my personal analysis and that of others, which is based on data and evidence collected over years of studying these processes. I read and studied the writings of such authors as former U.S. Army Intelligence Case Officer Julianne McKinney, who went on to found and be the director of the Electronic Surveillance Project. Here's a list of others. The initial phase is designed to gather information on the victim to get to know every aspect of the victim's life. Operations of this type are active surveillance. Surveillance is the act of observing a target using a number of tactics such as visual, wiretapping, electronic communications, computer hacking, and installing monitoring devices in the target's home or office in order to obtain information. There are two principal types of surveillance related to VITI programs that I will discuss. Covert surveillance, which is the most typical way of gathering information. Surveillance on the target in a way that does not allow the victim to know that they are being watched. The second, overt surveillance, is information gathering in a way that ensures that the target knows that they are being watched. The following steps are the steps in the remote neural monitoring process from selecting the victim to the end that likely ends in the victim's demise. From citizen to lab rat. Covert data collection. During the initial phase, the victim will have no idea that they are being watched, studied, and observed in nearly every aspect of their lives. All information from this point forward is entered into a profile protocol, which is a victim-specific collection of individual traits, habits, likes, dislikes, and so forth for each individual. Operators covertly monitor everything the victim does using a wide range of methods through the wall surveillance technology, hacks, etc. Built-in software architecture allows government agents and authorized contractors to use inherent system design to gather and collect any file open on Windows devices. By creating system processes such as elevated profiles, Operators own the Windows PC, able to monitor and collect any document in real time. These are internet addresses of files created on my computers, obviously accessible by these links. Windows indexing using elevated privileges can make any file disappear from the computer owner's view instantly, yet leave the file in the original folder undetectable by the victim providing perfect deniability later if the process is discovered. They study the victim's weaknesses. The perpetrators are looking for specific weaknesses that they may be able to exploit. If there is a secret fetish, any habit, especially ones that would be viewed as controversial or embarrassing to the victim, they will find it. Is the victim predisposed to bribery or other forms of nefarious persuasion? Strengths. Is the victim a leader or a follower? Does the victim have a natural ability to influence people? How does the Vitae respond to authority? It appears that strong-willed test subjects are treated to particularly harsh tactics, often in an in violent termination because presumably they are not likely to be broken easily, if ever. Likes and Dislikes. Every like and dislike will be charted and entered into the victim's profile protocol, assigning a primary antagonist, the attack agent. 
During this phase, the Pat C. Nemesis is presented. Neighbor, co-worker, ex-spouse, ex-partner, former friend, employer, or even a civilian contractor will begin to do small things that get the victim's attention in a negative way. From these actions, the victim will be able to associate this person, group, or organization with many of the issues they have faced since the problems began. They will select an attack narrative against the victim, although in the beginning there may be many as they ascertain which narrative is most effective. One or more of these false narratives will be selected for potential use to discredit the victim from a wide cross-section of society, from family to friends, colleagues, and long-time acquaintances. Each will be custom-tailored to have the maximum level of negativity to each group or individual. Infiltrate the victim's social network. By now, the victim will have acquired new friends who seem to have a lot in common with them. Some relationships may be intimate, all designed to gain the victim's trust that may later be exploited. Previously indoctrinated local perpetrators will be used to begin to spread unflattering allegations about the victim. At this point, the victims are being secretly manipulated towards actions that support the perpetrator's goals. The foundation of the operation is to use long-term planning prior to the initiation of activities against the victim. It appears that in this phase, the perpetrators decide how to move forward, up to and including just how they plan to eliminate the vitae if they become unmanageable. If the victim has a perceived weakness, Operators will begin to test each weakness individually by placing the victim in situations where a carefully planned event can be staged to gauge the victim's reaction. The perfect combination seems to be something that the victim would be particularly ashamed of being associated with if discovered by friends. Many women have complained that rumors of sexual promiscuity are common. Men are accused of sexual indiscretions. If the person is heterosexual and personally finds homosexual activity unacceptable for their own lives, they may try to associate the victim with homosexual activity. Accusations or rumors of pedophilia seem to be another favorite, likely because nearly everyone would find it easy to have strong opposition to anyone who would do that to a child. And rightfully so. The wide variety of methods used to wreck the victim's reputation seem to indicate that there is a well-oiled machine in place to disparage the individual with rumors planned inside each of the victim's social groups. The perpetrators use whatever lie they perceive as most effective at creating ill will inside the unsuspecting public who is being deceived as well oftentimes including the victim's own relatives. In this phase, any and every vice will be presented to the Vitae in order to evaluate it for future use and perhaps entrapment as well. The goal in this phase is to determine how their human lab rat will be used within the program. I talked about some of the tactics, but I am sure that these items are just scratching the surface here. Number two, we are watching you. In this stage, the perpetrators introduce one or two of a range of trigger tactics to evaluate which of them is most effective. Trigger tactics are particular actions designed to grab the victim's undivided attention and are things that the victim will come to associate with actions against them. This is the conditioning phase designed to ensure that the victim immediately associates these incidents as actions against and that the actions are perceived in the way that they were programmed to appear to the victim. During phase two, the victim's assigned nemesis will step up the level of aggression. The designated neighbor, co-worker, ex-spouse, ex-partner, 
former, or even close friend will do something that the victim will find reprehensible. Data gathered in phase one will aid in selecting this act. Up until this point, the Vitae has become more aware of the unusual activity, but not much more. The perpetrators are now seeking a more formalized response to the Vitae, a police report, restraining order, something to document a disagreement between the victim and their agent. That is the hook, the proof positive in the victim's mind that this person or group is behind these actions. Strangers may talk aloud about private matters that only the Vitae should know. These words are coming from people who speak their assigned lines within earshot of the victim. This heightens the victim's concern for their privacy and increase visible signs of paranoia. Traffic incidents began. Aggressive behavior, tailgating, and sandwiching happen at random times, but often. At the same time, there are likely instances of home invasions. The invaders do not normally take anything of significant value. They may even just move some object to a different location. They systematically step up the severity of the harassment until the victim begins to become concerned for their personal safety. And during all of these intrusions, increased signs of paranoia become evident. Again, the goal is for the Vitae to report one or more of these incidents, which by design will be impossible to validate. Small but noticeable computer and or phone hackings began to become obvious. Here's my fingers on the sides, not touching anything. See? On the sides. Not touching the screen. There's nothing I'm touching on the side. Oh, look, it's typing to me. It told me earlier I had cancer, said so about cancer. It's typing right now. It did not do this when I was out of town. Thank goodness I got it recorded. It's really getting scary. Sometimes they type me messages um, like, you have cancer. Wow. Okay, as you can see, the phone is acting on its own. I'm not doing anything. I must point out that these signs of surveillance are conspicuous because the perps want the victim to know that they are being surveilled. As mentioned earlier, it is called overt surveillance. In my case, a screen caption program was used that caused a momentary pause in the mouse, something just subtle enough to be noticed, but covert enough to look like secret surveillance. I now understand that it was not intended to be covert at all. It was designed to get my attention and to create concern for my computer's security. The individual act of invading personal privacy, such as home intrusions and hacking personal communication devices, are acts designed to instill fear about the most basic American right. A person's home is his or her castle secure from unreasonable search and seizure of property by the government. In this phase, operators make decisions on victim-centric harassment protocols. Victim-centric harassment protocols are the specific actions determined to be most effective at achieving the intended outcome of driving fear, stress, and anxiety in the victim's everyday life. The tactics become a permanent record to be used in future psychological warfare operations against the Vitae going forward. Once identified, those are the tactics that will be used permanently against the victim for months, years, or until the Vitae life is ended. Phase 3. Sensitization. Be afraid. Be very afraid. This phase cements the targeting activity identified in the harassment protocol as most effective against the victim. These are the tactics selected from phase two activity, which were considered to have the best influence on the victim's propensity to notice the activity. Actions may include using lots of cars of the same color, all red cars or white vans, for example. Vehicles with their high beam lights on and at call brighting may also be used. Noise campaigns. 
cars driving through the neighborhood or neighbors honking their horns or squealing tires. There may be several people with backpacks. People wearing a particular color. People standing in a particular spot every day. Or people standing near the victim looking at nothing in stores or other places. Strangers point at a phone in the vitized direction for long periods, but not exactly at the victim. A helicopter may be hired to fly over the victim's home several times in one day. Police cars may be used to crowd the victim or to appear at every other corner or so in the victim's path of travel. Street theater, which are elaborate schemes acted out by multiple perps, which is designed to make the victim feel unsafe, even that their life is in danger. Games called mobbing are used, which is the act of having several perps crowd the victim as they walk down the street or as they enter a confined area, any place that will make the victim feel vulnerable. Workplace mobbing. Several co-workers may be selected to constantly harass the victim in an apparent attempt to force the victim to lash out in the workplace against the assailants who are fully protected from any form of action from the employer who is also employed as part of the actions against the Vitae. These are just a few. However, each of these actions are designed to harass the victim with a highly concentrated effort to present a single group or theme over and over again. The actions are aggressive and potentially dangerous because it is impossible to predict how a victim will react to extreme tactics used to push the victim to the outer limits of their tolerance for the perceived danger. Perpetrators will get the victim's attention. This is event association. These actions are particularly effective because they terrorize the victim while solidifying the lie in the minds of the citizen perps that the victim is suffering from mental illness while the victim is actually responding to the psychological torture that the citizens are helping to inflict on the Vitae. In the early days, before I realized how I was being targeted, I associated some items or actions that I was programmed to recognize as potential attacks, basically because I did not understand the technology. The operators would attack me with electronic pain stimulation shortly after they would arrange for one of their perps to sit next to me with a backpack. Naturally, this person sitting near me doing nothing in some cases would be suspicious once I was conditioned to recognize the gang stalking. More on that in a few moments. Once I experienced a painful shock of microwave or nerve stimulation through neuropathic attack, naturally I would associate the person, and more specifically the backpack, with the attack. I surmise that these backpacks must have contained either targeting equipment or the actual portable electronic emissions device. Based on their actions or inactions, however, it was clear to me that the people who carried the backpacks did not do anything around the time of the attacks. So I also eliminated them as the actual assailants. In actuality, I later learned that I had fallen into the sick game, a trap to try to force me to act out against people who were unwitting citizens, whom were told to do things that they likely had no idea were part of a cruel psychological mind game. They were unsuccessful. I did not react to the people. I later learned that remote devices are not needed in order for the perpetrators to inflict pain. It can be done from a considerable distance away and without the assistance of any person or portable device. As in the previous two phases, the ultimate outcome during this process was to produce sufficient distress that it prompts the victim to report any of these incidents on social media or even better to a formal authority such as police, doctor, or mental health professional. 
the very real concerns about events that are 100% real incidents when presented to someone outside the immediate eyesight of the victim will sound like one or more potential forms of mental illness. Phase four, the takedown. This is the act of removing the victim from normal society to isolate them into an environment designed just for them. By now, every person not directly associated with the operation against the Vitae is kept at arm's length where they cannot infer anything about the victim that was not selected for release by the perpetrators. This phase of the operation completes the totally rewritten life story of the Vitae. You see, whatever contributions the Vitae actually has made to their families or to society by this point do not matter. This is true in work and in our social lives as well. You see, Evidence points to the fact that this operation is predicated on the premise that in society, it does not matter what you do. What matters is what people believe that you do. That fact is one of the strongest pillars of the sick and evil program. At this point, some work episode has either caused the victim to lose their employment or the victim fears it will happen any day. Following loss of income, the landlord or bank will likely be cruel and insensitive, deploying tactics designed to force the victim from their home with the desired outcome of making the victim homeless or as a minimum to make the victim nomadic or confined to a location under the perpetrator's complete control. Active schemes create a wide variety of problems designed to eliminate all income and to drain any financial reserves that the Vitae has. By now, friends treat the Vitae differently, creating an atmosphere for the victim that everyone is in on a secret that the victim does not know about or understand. Every job the Vitae applies for normally will not even earn an interview or if the victim is hired, they are quickly fired or forced out with little or no reason. Money is fleeting fast. The Vitae has a list of people to blame, but none of it completely adds up based on what the victim understands. No one listens or even wants to hear what the Vitae has to say at this point because the entire social circle has been tainted by a wide range of rumors and in the windows. Previous close friends and acquaintances avoid the victim, generally using language that suggests that the problems are all in the victim's own making, or even worse, words and actions from people that the Vitae's encounter suggest that they believe that the incidents are all in the victim's mind. There have been one or more close friends who have recently committed acts that make their continued friendship in the victim's mind, impossible going forward. If the Vitae is lucky, they've discovered by this point that they are trapped in this formal covert mind control experimentation and testing program. Tragically, however, most will not understand the dangerous world of lies and deceit that has taken over their entire lives. By now, in many victims' eyes, their life may be hopeless. Phase five, establish control. Phase five is an all out attack. This is all encompassing psychological warfare in its purest form. Operatives use a wide range of tactics to attack the victim from the subtle passive aggressive remarks to over in your face aggressive mind games, entrapments, as well as complex and highly choreographed situations designed to encapsulate every aspect of the victim's life. I found the passive aggressive attacks very interesting because this technique was the most difficult for me to detect and understand for a long time. Acts of passive aggression fit the program perfectly because they are difficult to detect by anyone outside the full context of the victim's personal experiences. Targeted passive aggression tactics require a thorough understanding of the types of comments that the victim would find objectionable and the ability to skillfully mix those types of comments into the context of normal communications. 
passive aggression is the mind game that provides the means to provide psychological stress to a victim in plain sight while showing little signs of aggressive acts to the casual observer. Without background on the comments, an innocent bystander would see nothing wrong in the exchange. The goal at this point appears to be to remove the vitae from society, to incarcerate, institutionalize, or euthanize. Passive aggressive comments are just one small area of the mind games played by perpetrators. Let's examine a few of the most significant techniques used to terrorize Americans caught inside this hell. Gang stalking. Gang stalking or organized gang stalking, which is a more accurate term, is one of the primary harassment tools. It means exactly what the name implies. Groups of individuals coordinated and managed to overtly follow or stalk a victim in a way that is not easily seen by anyone other than the target. But because of the sensitization efforts in earlier phases, the victim will easily recognize these situations. Stalking, by the way, is illegal under U.S. Federal Code 2261A. I will use number two, quote, whoever with the intent to kill, injure, harass, intimidate, or place under surveillance with the intent to kill, injure, harass, intimidate another person, B, causes, attempts to cause, or would be reasonably expected to cause emotional distress to a person. Stalking statutes are complex, but in my untrained assessment, their description of conditions fit these remote neural monitoring operations with perfection. These organized crimes are designed to inflict psychological distress on the victim in public spaces with consequences that are impossible to predict because the victims can feel a very real and terrifying sense of immediate danger. The gang stalking technique skirts prosecution because since there are many different people used in the activity, it is difficult to prove based on current law. Yet, the psychological effects of stalking can be demoralizing and traumatizing for some, virtually impossible to ignore for many. Evidence apparent after closer study shows that stalking is also the primary weapon used to facilitate a false diagnosis of mental illness. The complicity built into these crimes is alarming as well. This is in your face overt control of every aspect of the victim's life. Tactics designed to give the Vitae the sense of hopelessness, paranoia, and despair. The citizens may have no idea that they are participating in a terror campaign against other innocent citizens because they have been lied to about the reason for what they are doing to the Vitae. The citizens' perps may falsely believe that they are helping the government to control a criminal or a host of other potential lies about the Vitae, when in fact they are participating in acts designed to terrorize other citizens. National security letters and mandates for secrecy prevent the citizens from speaking out at the risk of imprisonment or worse. Their complicity makes a citizen a criminal participant for life, a fact that can easily be used to manipulate the citizen perps into further actions against the victim and others, fearing they could also be held accountable for the crimes if they do not help to eliminate the victim that now is a threat to exposing them as well. The conundrum must be an unimaginable hell. A former CIA official who worked in the safe houses reveals that they were used not only for drug testing, but to study sexual behavior and how it could be used to manipulate people. How do you take a woman who is willing to use her body to get money out of a guy to get him to talk about things which are much more important, like state secrets? We learned a lot about human nature in the bedroom. We started to pick up knowledge that could be used in operations. The honeypot.
Perhaps the most effective weapon against Vitais is the honeypot. Honeypot is a slang term that describes an intimate relationship for hire. The partner that is paid by the perpetrators to enter into a relationship with the Vitae for the sole purpose of gaining their trust so that they can betray them later. I firmly believe that every victim of this insidious program has a honeypot in their life. Close, intimate relationships build a trust and bond that cannot be otherwise achieved. This misplaced trust provides the perfect opportunity for the program's operators to use it and the inherent vulnerability that comes from trust to entrap, trick, exploit, or even eliminate the Vitae. Using a honeypot, the perpetrators have access to anything they want or need from the victim, up to and including the means to end the victim's life. Honeypots have been a mainstay as the means to track and deceive me. Since the perpetrators know everything about you, they can find just the perfect person who has the looks and can be taught to say and do the right things to ensure that the victim develops strong emotional attachments. One of the most offensive things that I've had to get over is the fact that I am 99.999% sure that I married a honeypot. That is an unbelievably sick and demented thing to do to anyone. Following our divorce, that woman then disappeared from all search engines. Go figure. As soon as I started to understand this program, everything that never added up about the so-called relationships with that woman added up completely. Last note, and this is to those people working as perp honeypots. They are very precise words for people who sleep with others for money. Your job is to smile, be nice, sleep with the person, get paid. Manage communications. All contacts with Vitais must be managed. Communications to and from the victims are tightly controlled, limiting them to individuals who are clear to communicate with the Vitae. For victims of r &M like me, every communication is either controlled prior to communication or likely sanitized after the communication. Meaning, outgoing communications such as phone calls are blocked altogether or turncated to one of the their agents, and casual or incidental contacts are likely approached by agents who probably spread one or more of the false narratives about the victim to avoid the opportunity that the citizen has anything but the controlled narrative view of the victim. Electronic communications are restricted to mediums under the total control of federal agencies or authorized contractors. Every cell phone that I have owned since 2004 has been under the complete control and surveillance of these operators. I was blocked from promoting my videos on YouTube. I've sent videos to dozens of people who are part of a victim's group and later discovered that not a single one of the other victims had viewed the video. Is it possible that like-minded people would not care to know what others in their same situation have to say on a video? That is unlikely to the point of ridiculous. These are posts on my mother's Facebook page. There have been no detectable interactions in the form of positive or negative comments. How is that possible? Directed energy. Directed energy comes in various forms. The most common type is microwave energy. Within the microwave spectrum, there are two primary types used for very different purposes. Directed microwave energy, similar to the type used in a microwave oven, but operating on a frequency of 95 gigahertz, is primarily used as a so-called non-lethal pain weapon. According to Raytheon, the Active Denial Systems platform emits a millimeter wave that, quote, penetrates the skin to 1 64th of an inch, producing intolerable heating sensation that causes targeted individuals to flee, unquote. 
I have personally experienced this weapon, but unlike when these individuals knew and expected something to happen, it is a far different scenario when a person has no idea why the skin suddenly started to burn, when they have no idea where it's coming from, and when they have no idea why this is happening. Imagine standing in a public space or in your private home and getting a tremendous burning sensation for no apparent reason. This directed energy beam, when being with is considered, can be used to target a person and will not affect others around the target so long as the beam width and proximity to other persons are considered in the targeting. To unsuspecting citizens, these are terrorist acts, pure and simple. For the perpetrators, these are the perfect weapons for inflicting torture from a distance that is undetectable and untraceable. Stop for a moment and imagine trying to explain this weapon's use on you when no one else saw the weapon or felt the pain. The logical conclusion for anyone the victim may try to tell about this experience would likely be, there's no way. That's crazy talk. These weapons are pure evil. Second, the pulse microwave device is commonly known as as voice to skull, V2K for short, or microwave hearing. One other term, which seems to be right out of a movie about a mad scientist, is called voice of God, which is most offensive in my opinion because it's tantamount to a claim of God level powers over humans. In 1994, the Air Force Research Laboratory carried out experiments where scientists used technology to transmit phrases into the heads of human subjects. How? By burying subliminal messages in microwaves and beaming them into a person's head. It seems like a weapon torn from the pages of a comic book. The Air Force denies it's working on one. But patent number 6470214, issued on October 22, 2002, says otherwise. The patent title, Method and Device for Implementing the Radio Frequency Hearing Effect. Patent holder, the U.S. Air Force. Here's how the V2K process works. When people are illuminated with properly modulated low-power microwave, the sensation is reported as a buzzing, clicking, or hissing, which seems to originate within or just behind the head. The phenomenon occurs at poser frequencies as low as milliwatts per centimeter. With carrier frequencies, intelligible speech may be created. When a directed microwave pulse in the gigahertz range strikes the human body, a very small temperature perturbation occurs. This is associated with a sudden expansion of the slightly heated tissue. This expansion is fast enough to produce an acoustic wave. If a pulse stream is used, it could be possible to create an internal acoustic field in the 5 to 15 kilohertz range, which is audible. Try to imagine the scenario that some have described of a person talking directly in your head saying horrible things, telling the victim to kill themselves or to harm others. This is a sick and barbaric crime. I thank God every day that I have escaped this pain thus far. I take you back to the words of Dr. Jean McCall in the 1990s as they bragged about their achievement, saying that now we can talk to selected adversaries in a fashion that would be most disturbing to them. The recent list of people claiming to have suffered this way is not lost on me because it appears the trend is to use violence against people who look more like me than the majority of the population. I spoke earlier about the electrically induced body pain, the capability exists to create a variety of sensations from hot to cold, 
and pain in various parts of the body, all created using sensory arousal on a neurological level. These so-called non-lethal weapons can cause death either directly or indirectly. They are deployed against people like me by the hundreds, perhaps thousands today. The threat of private sector access and government misuse are issues that not only have not been explored by the American public, but the mere mention of the existence of these technologies appear to be considered a threat to national security in the minds of the people carrying out these crimes. There are other technologies and torture techniques as well, however, these are the most common. When all of these torture methods are used in concert, their goal appears to be to break the victim psychologically and record every moment of the process. The United States deployment of the RNN system along with its network of support, surveillance, and counter-surveillance support systems is perhaps the biggest open secret in human history. Part of the reason that this vast web of covert and overt lawlessness can exist is because of the unconstitutional provisions of the Patriot Act. Within our government, there are individuals who have the requirement to be able to effectively lie as part of their job description. Their job is to present sometimes outrageous lies in a way that the information seems credible and that this lie is ultimately believed. So what I wanted to see is if you could give me a yes or no answer to the question, does the NSA collect any type of data at all on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans? No, sir. It does not? Not wittingly. There are cases where they could in inadvertently perhaps uh, collect but not, not wittingly. All right. These individuals can use documents like this without the risk of challenge even to the truthfulness of the information from which the lies are based. Seriously? Why is the very existence of such a document not a huge red flag? Citizens are compelled to cooperate and prohibited from challenging any aspect of what they have been directed to do under the threat of actions such as fines or imprisonment. The goal is 100% control of the message. The term information dominance has consumed a substantial portion of national resources in the areas of communication as well as neural sciences for the past couple of decades. These all-encompassing efforts include programs to gain absolute access to all forms of communication. From the highest platform of hacking the human brain, they want access to all information encompassing every facet of human life. The powerful elites in the U.S. hierarchy evidently seek to know everything about anything or anyone at any time. Information is power. Information about the thoughts of anyone is the ultimate power. It appears that they also seek to control public perception in all things as well, from mass media to social media. I spoke earlier about the use of everyday citizens to terrorize the Vitae. That participation does not stop there. They are important players in the world of weaponized social media. After evaluation for suitability, these citizen soldiers, which include community action groups, church groups, and others, or just your everyday so-called concerned citizen, enter this realm of disinformation merchants. They are likely served in letters such as the National Security Letter, which forbids disclosure of the circumstances surrounding their involvement, and then they are trapped. You have seen them sharing outrageous lies online like flat earth, alien abductions, and the pervasive presence of demonic cults, etc. Each propaganda circle specializes in a particular type of disinformation. 
as the message grows in sophistication, I have noticed that recently their messages are being spread by adding factual information mixed in with outrageous lies to confuse any casual observer. Their ultimate goal seems to be to have the observer simply throw their hands up in confusion and discount everything about the individual topics as lies. This is a near-perfect method of discrediting hard facts by associating these facts with well-known lies such as Flat Earth. This is disinformation, which has been the principal tool of the intelligence agencies for over a 100 years. Best of all, this industry was authorized by the National Defense Authorization Act of fiscal year 2013, Section 1078A amended the Information and Educational Exchange Act of 1948 and the Foreign Relations Authorization Act of 1987, which allows for materials produced by the State Department and the Broadcasting Board of Governors, BBG, to be released within the United States borders for the archivists of the United States. Simply stated, the U.S. government made it legal to lie to us if the U.S. government deemed it to be in the government's interests. Let's stop a moment and let that sink in. We Americans told our government that it is perfectly fine and legal to lie to us if they, the government, believes that the lie is in the government's best interests. Seriously? What the heck did you think they would do with that type of power? How's that working out so far? Our government routinely lies to us about monumentally important issues, most of which directly affect physical conditions as well as life or death of our fellow citizens. Sometimes the line is blurred, as in the case of Colin Powell's speech before the United Nations. Every statement I make today is backed up by sources, solid sources. These are not assertions. What we're giving you are facts and conclusions based on solid intelligence. Then there are outright lies. What I'm saying is that the director of national intelligence in March did directly lie to Congress, which is against the law. He said that they were not collecting any data on American citizens. You're talking about James and it, Clapper. And it, tur and it turns out they're collecting billions of data on phone calls every day. So it was a lie. What I'm saying is that by lying to Congress, which is against the law, he severely damaged the credibility of the entire intelligence committee. Now, it's community. From a logical standpoint, which reason would be a more fitting reason for our government to require the collection of metadata on every citizen through the dragnet surveillance of the entire population? a possible terrorist in the country, or efforts to manage tens of thousands of Americans who are secretly being monitored through illegal remote neural monitoring programs that the American people would likely view as reprehensible acts against us. I know the answer, but I'll let you decide for yourself. Our plight today falls on deaf ears. Federal agencies armed with the instant authority and credibility afforded by the emblems of our great nations lie, deny, or ignore us as we victims continue to tell our truth on deaf ears. I, like thousands of other victims, do not deserve this. No one does. Thanks for watching. In order to view the complete video, please go to YouTube and search for 21st Century Mind Control Programs Remote Neural Monitoring or click the link in the video notes. Thank you.